Mm. Okay, now we're recording. Hi. Hi. We thought we were recording before. And it was really good. Sorry you missed it. <laughs> uh, my name's Milena. This is Reverend Mike McMorrow. You're here with us on Thoughts on Talks, where we share our thoughts on the Sunday Talks. In the same room this time. Yes, because last time we were in different states and not yes. just different states of consciousness. No, I was in Denver. Yeah, so how was that? It was good. It was really fun to do the Zoom uh, in my underwear and nobody knew. <laughs> not really. <laughs> I know. It's just bad, isn't it? But you could not resist saying it. I know. <laughs> and those who know me, yeah, it sounds like him. Probably try that. So, no, but, uh, yeah, Denver, I was back yeah. there for the Centers for Spiritual Living Convention where we elected a new spiritual leader, the first one since. The wow. two organizations became one, so hmm. we now have Reverend Dr. Edward Villon. How do you spell that? V-I-L-L-O-E-J-E-O-N. <laughs> I think I that up. Something like that. I could look in your notes and There's see, but did you spell it There's two L's right and a there? J and an O and an E and an N. I know that for sure, and it begins okay. with a V. You know, they say that as long as it starts and ends on the right letter, your huh. brain will just fill in the rest and See? you'll figure it out. That's so right. try that. Try it. Google him yeah. with just a V and an Just N. put in Santa Ro CSL, Santa Rosa, or uh, CSLSR.org, mm. and it will take you right there. That's easier. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, quite brilliant, he's written several books, fan of the um, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. Gita. <laughs> I did notice that you, you tried different pronunciations throughout the uh, Yeah, talk. that I don't know why that's so. Probably because it's a different I think the VOD is, yeah. Mm. Well, and, and if I remember that, it's Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. right? And just make the VOD like the First conjunction. Name. Oh, okay. Like Because it's two words, yes. Bhagavad and then Gita. Gita, yes. So but I, I always feel bad because I feel like I'm insulting some ancient uh, sacred thing. Mm, but you're not but, trying to. No. You're trying to say it. Respectfully. Yeah. So you, and you mentioned in yesterday's talk, which was the talk for February 23rd, 2020. The reflections 2020, on my glasses are like tripping me out. We talked about, or you talked about reflections in your talk too. So yeah. see how it all ties Ooh. together. So if you want to go back and watch the Sunday talk <laughs> now, and then come back to hear our thoughts, you can go do that at the CSLGH uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be the guy with the suit on, by the way. Mm -hmm. In case it's hard to tell. It'll kind of throw you off. <laughs> he looks just like that, but with a suit on. <laughs> so the topic, well, it says it's like you're my mirror. It's, yes. So the reflections, see how that all ties together? Yep. Um, and you tied it together with a story from the Bhagavad Gita, which is... Yes. Well, as the opening mm, the opening scene of the bhagavad gita okay yeah so that is um pretty cool to connect concepts today with ancient spirituality i love doing that and i love how new thought does that mm -hmm. helps us stay connected and and learn things about well, other cultures well, i think beliefs in our uh, self-absorption as uh, modern peoples we think that the things that we're going through are unique mm -hmm. to modern people and they really are not whether it's a bhagavita right, let's try it again <laughs> bhagavad gita there you go or the old testament right uh that uh, uh or even the poly texts of buddhism that mm -hmm. <clears throat> these uh challenges it's just the human condition. Yeah. And in some ways, it's kind of depressing how little we've learned in <laughs> thousands of years. How human we still are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, some of the things that came to me when you were talking about the wise chariot driver actually being Lord Krishna himself, mm -hmm. who was, uh, you know, just sort of guiding Prince Arjuna along. And I thought of... Um, 
a lot of like a Joseph Campbell type similar mentor and mentee relationships throughout, you know, all kinds of stories. So, and songs too. Like at mm -hmm. one point I, I thought of Jesus Take the Wheel, mm -hmm. which is a country song, I think by an American Idol winner, uh, Carrie Underwood. Mm -hmm. And- um, Trying to stack the deck for the voting, I guess. <laughs> what? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, and then, um, you know, like there's always in, in the heroes, are you going to sing the song? Would you like no, to, I'll take a ahead. break and just wait. I was going to say something sarcastic and snard. So oh, think, so never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, Joseph Campbell, hero's journey. Yes. There's a wise mentor generally, and sometimes disguised, sometimes humble. Mm -hmm. Uh, so like the Obi-Wan. Exactly. I, I had a bunch of them crashing in my head, so I didn't know who to pick first. But I mean, Obi-Wan presented himself as a as a wise elder, but this is one in disguise. Yes. Which is kind of cool. Um, so when we can look at everybody as divine, everybody in our relationships around us then we are kind of seeing our own reflection right so is that how well, we tie it in there well yeah because you know everything that we experience in life is a projection of our own consciousness which well, is a trick. well not not every not everything because mm. as we become more aware mm -hmm. right we we can uh discern the difference between our ego getting caught up in things and the way things actually are. Mm. But I, I personally think it's much safer to stay skeptical around all of it uh, because mm. people can talk themselves into doing all kinds of things when they start a sentence with God told me that. Oh yeah. Well, and I, and I do know people who speak this way and okay. you know, and it's probably true. And maybe, you know, maybe it's true for myself. It might just be because I just go, oh, that's just my ego. Mm. Right? Well, and because it can be true on different levels of our, of our consciousness and of our existence too. Like, well, if it's a feeling thing that mm -hmm. is like deep and has a sense of equanimity and connectedness in it, uh, you know, I can trust that. Mm. But if it's like, Hey, I got this idea. <laughs> I think what you should do is get, 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 get. So it's That's a, a scheme. learning to trust our inner voices and recognize the different ones because right. we all have all these, a host of characters within us. Right. And, and, uh, you know, learning to sort, uh, you know, inspiration from a scheme, mm. which is really the difference between living, uh, successfully and, uh, or experiencing folly. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there are lessons in folly. <laughs> yeah, I that's mean, true. And, uh, hey, you hey. know, sometimes what looks like folly actually is just um, a little side path, a little side adventure. A little tweet fest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. A mental tweet fest. Yeah, it could be. Hmm. Hmm. So I see <laughs> this part. I don't remember hearing you say, but you Googled what is God and you had 19 pages of all kinds of references. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. Try that at home. Google what is God. Uh huh. And notice I didn't say who is God or when mm -hmm. is God, but mm -hmm. what is God? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 19 different pages, most of them with Judeo Christian type of references. But that could also be because of where you were searching from. So right. well, I mentioned that okay. in, because I was accessing it from the 818. Okay. Versus uh, say India or yeah. Sri Lanka or Saudi Arabia. Yeah, right. and, and there's also algorithms that are kind of measuring not only where we are, but what we've searched before. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, it's hard to get out of our little bubble of things that we've already 
shown interest in because yeah. they're just re reflecting that back to us. Yes, exactly. So another way the world around us is reflecting ourselves back to us. So one of the pictures you showed um, was, or one of the slides that you showed yesterday mm -hmm. was of a woman, a blonde woman, and it's three photos right next to each other. And one says mirror, one says photograph, and one says real life. Right. And they pretty much look all exactly the same. Yeah, was that like a makeup commercial or something? No, and you had put it up there at the end and just kind of posed the question, see if you can see any difference in this. Right. So what I saw was that one looked like it was taken from the right side, one was taken from the left side, oh. and one was straight on. Oh. And I did a Google search for that picture to see what was what was she trying to show in You can in do that. that? Yeah. You just put the image up and you go search. I just put mirror photo real life and oh, found it and clever. then look for images. But you can also take an image if you already have it mm -hmm. and do a Google image search for similar Interesting. pictures. Mm -hmm. so, see the things you learn on Thoughts see? on Talks. So I found a YouTube video with this woman mm -hmm. who is in the pictures. And uh, what she was saying was people sometimes think that they look better in photos or mm -hmm. better in the mirror and uh, that there have been articles that she found that say we look better in real life than we think we do and other ones that said we don't look as good as we think we do so she was presenting all of those things right. and she said ultimately in the mirror um, we get used to which asymmetry is in each of our faces and she went into showing um, how to test the symmetry of your face. Mm -hmm. She took a picture, cut it in half and put two of the same side together and showed how odd it looks that actually perfect symmetry, although the human brain finds the more symmetrical people more attractive generally, if you put up some of the well-known attractive celebrities, um, their faces are not perfectly symmetrical. And when you put them in a mirror image of the same half looks pretty weird. Well, then how come I'm not a famous celebrity then? <laughs> Who says you're not? Maybe you I, just don't know if it. If you were to do that, because I broke my nose in college and I never got it fixed. So mm. if you really, now that I point, point it out to you, you're going to see. Now we're all going to stare. Has, <laughs> it has like a, it's like a crescent moon. See, you say that, so, but it doesn't look anything like a crescent moon to me. And that's the other thing she didn't mention, but we're hypercritical of ourselves. Oh my gosh, it just goes out like that. <laughs> <laughs> I saved the link if anybody's uh, interested. I don't okay. want to take the time to type it now, but um, <laughs> she said that uh, in a mirror, we actually like our reflections better because we're moving. And so that we could see more of the three dimensional of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then in a photo, it's a moment. It's a still moment. Oh. And so... Uh, That's Memorex. Yeah, it's a copy. Is it live or is it Memorex? <laughs> and then in real Just life... myself. Yes. <laughs> I remember those cassette tape commercials. Yeah, cassette tapes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Give us a thumbs up if you know what a cassette tape is. <laughs> um, in, in the real life pictures, uh, or in the real life, in the comparison that she did, um, there are so many other things that we are responding to. Rather, it's not just how we look, mm -hmm. it's how we move, how warm we are, how our voice, you know, sounds, mm -hmm. and all the things together. So, in real life, our attractiveness is based on different things. And then at the end of it, after all of this, like, really specific comparison of how people look and she took Tom Cruise's face and Bradley Cooper's face and did the symmetry on them or asymmetry and then she said but it's better not to really focus on what we look like and focus on the inside and what shines through us. I think I think people are actually much more attracted to charisma. Yes. Right. And to she did light, mention that too. Yeah, yeah. To the light within, really. Yeah. And I've, it's. Um, I've always, I keep meaning to look that up because there's probably some Latin. Let's look it uh, up right now. Derivative. Care from the Latin care. So I would look meaning, up, not because if oh I. Oh my goddess. 
<laughs> He's just going to keep making stuff up until I find something. So I'm going to put charisma etymology. Yes. Okay. And it's from the Greek charis, K H A R I S, which means favor or grace. Mm. The Greek charisma with a K, and then Latin charisma from the mid 17th century with a CH. Favor or grace. Grace. So mm. I wonder if that was something that the gods bestow on you, or is, or is that a. Um, Interesting. Let's see. This is from Edim Online, which okay. is etymology online. Yes. Uh, a special spiritual gift or power divinely conferred, mm -hmm. talent from God. Latinized form of the Greek favor or divine gift. And Charis was the name of one of the three attendants of Aphrodite. So you uh -huh. weren't far off with the goddess thing. Hey, Amen. We're going into March. <laughs> Sacred feminine. Oh. For yeah. five Sundays. You're going to be so feminine by I'm the end of that. going to be so femi. <laughs> I don't think so. You'll I'm going to be wearing goddess wear by the you'll last You'll have week. more charisma. I have like flowing i'll be like rhiannon i'll be like stevie nicks doing rhiannon okay please attempt to perform that for us <laughs> that would be awesome so yes there's a lot more about Actually, that would be this. kind of fun maybe i could just staple some gauze on the inside of my suit jacket and then <laughs> right? do it <laughs> Do it. You only the people who watch this will know what the heck he's trying to Reverend, do. Reverend, he'll do anything for a <laughs> laugh, Mike. <clears throat> then you'll know what Stevie Nicks puts up with when she does all those. Oh, I don't think she cares. She loves it. Well, she it. might now. Yeah. She's probably pushing seventy now. But, <laughs> but when she was thirty something, ooh, <laughs> she was like. The magical musical witch. Yeah, man, Fleetwood Mac back in the day. Mm hmm My the guys in the room next door us could not stop playing that damn album. <laughs> that and Peter Frampton Live. Like dee 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 dee. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a little time capsule. Yeah. So. so why is March celebrating Divine Feminine specifically? Hi. Or is it just know. a CSL uh, I programming choice? I think it's just a wonderful exploration <laughs> of femininity. Is that what you're trying to do right now? Because it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, we just don't have enough women in religion. Well, uh, not in New... Th I mean, in New Thought, it's mostly women. Mm. And the ministers are mostly women mostly yeah. yeah yeah so um but that's because other religions really haven't been very welcoming to female spiritual leaders mm -hmm. and so you know. yes well so we'll see what i do with it that's I, that, right. one of the, actually one of the things that i really like about ernest holmes is mm -hmm. he's the first one who spoke to god uh, one of the aspects of the divine is being the androgynous one. Mm. So, uh, and I had already kind of been pondering this myself, you know, as a 40 year old, mm -hmm. um, because I've always, I don't know why this subject has been so fascinating to me, but I've always kind of pondered the nature of the divine going, okay. going way back, even when I was, you know, a big Jesus guy and, you know, the good shepherd and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but still, um, well, still, it seemed like there was something else going on there. Like well, a curiosity about what the face of God looked like, or if you were in the presence of... I don't know that I would have had the capacity... Mm. Uh, because to to think in such ways, because mm -hmm. in the way that I was raised to understand uh, Christianity, you didn't really 
question such things. Okay. But I, I've always been fascinated by uh, Pentecost Sunday. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Where Jesus had said, Jesus breathed on the apostles and he said, <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And of course they went, oof, you put too much garlic in that hummus. <laughs> No, they, um, but and, I've always thought they that get was like little flames over their of, heads, tongues of fire. And then they were, it said that they spontaneously received the gift to, of speaking in all kinds of different languages. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's where the speaking in tongues comes from in the Pentecostal movement. Uh, however, that idea of receiving the Holy spirit has always, um, mm. made me think a little more deeper on what's going on. So within the confines of that faith system. So I get to religious science and Mm -hmm. homes, and I've been thinking about this also, that uh, if God, God must have both aspects Mm -hmm. of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I don't even know that I knew the word androgynous uh, before uh, coming here, but uh, mm. It seems to me that the totality of God would have that that it would be without gender, even though I was raised in a very patriarchal mm. system in Catholicism mm. and in Christianity generally. Didn't so, you like? Wasn't there a big thing about androgynous rock stars in like the seventies? I mean, isn't that what? They were like David Bowie and, uh, you know. He wasn't androgynous, though. So. Okay. But, I mean, I mean wasn't wearing... he referred that to? Well, maybe the highbrow androgyn- critic types. Okay. But for, you know, a kid growing up on he an Air just Force kind of... base out in the middle of nowhere, he was just a weirdo wearing makeup. <laughs> right? And then Mick Jagger started wearing makeup. And I was mm. like, what the? Ugh. And then the 80s happened and everybody wore makeup. Yeah, well, then it was different because it was like mascara that ran. Not all of it. And it looked like, you know, evil. <laughs> mm. or, or I actually I actually liked that movement in music because I kind of felt like the 70s was like, all out of love. <laughs> I'm so lost without you. It was like, oh, God, somebody shoot me. You felt like it was too or mellow. Or the arena rock. Yeah, mm. man, where's that? Because that was the thing about you know, I mean, if you think about the who, you know, my mm-hmm. generation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That just kind of, you know, I, I suppose you couldn't keep that kind of energy going. But the hmm. punk movement, well, in England, mm-hmm. which in those days, you you know, if, if you'd spent any time in England at that time, uh, those were the Thatcher years mm. or, or leading up to them. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of angst in the yeah. country, you know. And that's where their jobs and art uh, allows people to express yeah. angst. And, and so the, these that. guys came in and then New Wave then kind of incorporated that mm-hmm. in the same way that in our country, uh, you know, rap, rap was really this, you know, an old white guy's observation at the time um, was there was like energy and power mm-hmm. and frustration. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, you had all this gang stuff going on and, and in a way in those days, this might be controversial, but mm. I didn't say it. My sociology professor said it okay. that the gang, that uh, the third gang in that scenario between like the Crips and the Bloods mm-hmm. was the police. Mm, right because they had their own code right so <clears throat> anyway so you had this thing going on and rap came out of that and now we have uh hip-hop right uh which is you know gosh i would say even mainstream now not that it rap's is, not yeah but at first i just kind of dismissed rap because uh, well not dismissed it but just kind of thought oh it's just because I was a big R and B fan. Okay. Right. 
with you know. so that has different sensibilities well um, it was melodic it right, was yeah. musical i mean it was sly stone curtis mm -hmm. mayfield uh you know lou rawls i mean way back right mm -hmm. when they called it soul music you know yeah and, and, and then rap is all rhythm and lyrics. Well, I just kind of thought it was for poets who can't sing. <laughs> okay. Right? But then, but then you know, uh, mm -hmm. what's his name? Uh, was it Young MC and MC Hammer? I even some before of these, uh, then, yeah, like Chuck D. And they started getting these rhythmic things, and then he's got the dance grooves going on, and then they were kind of having fun with it. Yeah. So I don't know where we're going. Uh, we just took a little tour through musical history, yeah. Um, yeah. from androgyny to um, that's right, androgyny. That's how we started. I think. Yeah. So now, who's the androgynous one? Was it was Beck wasn't like uh, androgynous? No. No, uh, I don't know that. It's, what about that? It's, uh, uh, such a that Norwegian or Swedish one, Bjork. Bjork is definitely a girl. Okay. She's a girly girl. She's not a man. No, oh. <laughs> I guess you haven't paid much attention to Bjork. She's a cute not. little elfin, little like doll-like, okay. sweet-faced creature who's very artsy. And um, what about that dude from The Cure, Robert was, Smith? Would he be? Well, you know, his heyday was the '80s, and he's one of those with the smeared black eyeliner right. and stuff. No, well, I don't. I don't think he looked androgynous. He looked like a man with smeared makeup. Okay. Yeah, so I think that that trend has shifted. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily anybody like that. Like there this was would in the eighties. Actually, be good on Pop Conscious, wouldn't it? This welcome to this episode of Pop Conscious, <laughs> which was a, a podcast I did uh, a few years ago. Yeah, anyway. I mean. Uh, ultimately, it's let's say it's a reflection of society and where society is to bring it back to the theme of reflection right. mm -hmm. that um, art and and music are all the ways that we express how we are seeing and interacting with and feeling feeling well, our way yeah, through you know, the world. That's, that's a really great point, right? So in this in the seventies, we had you know Crosby, Stills, and Nash reflecting what was going on with Kent State and mm. so forth, mm -hmm. and uh, you know David Bowie and Space Oddity was its yep. own reflection of how weird it was to live in London in those days. No, I, I really <laughs> don't know, but but as we were speaking to uh, rap being a reflection of what was going on in that community, yeah, and then it kind of gets uh, I don't want to say hijacked, but folded into the culture well and i mean artists that's start kind doing of, different things with it yeah, yeah. And, and that's just the evolution of, just yeah. like with with language where we went back to the etymology of you know the root word of charisma right um every musical style and genre has its roots in something and then it evolves mm -hmm. so um we're all just playing with being alive <laughs> and being humans in this mm -hmm. world. And so, so I just had this weird thought. Ooh. So thinking about this idea that we're all reflection. So mm -hmm. imagine that we were just all 7 billion mirrors. Ooh. You know what happens when you put mirrors um, across from each other, you get that echo effect it looks eternal and infinite Ooh, infinite the infinite diamond of Whoa. reality multifaceted mm -hmm. it does get pretty trippy when you start looking at the metaphysical aspects of of how we are divine sparks creating on you know, this canvas mm -hmm. of the world and, and really our perception of everything is kind of like a social agreement. Mm -hmm. And so we've all agreed, okay, this is what a chair looks like. This is what the color, you know, green looks like. This is, so we all kind of communicate because we've agreed on what to mm -hmm. call things. But in reality, we don't know if what one person is seeing is actually what we're seeing because it's all just, we're all in our own little bubbles in a, you know, a lot of ways. That's interesting. So here's another digression for you. Okay. And this, I believe, 
comes from linguists studying the Odyssey. Okay. And I don't know. Homer's? I, yeah, I mm -hmm. must have heard this on NPR or something. Okay. But it, they determined that there was no word for blue. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this? Mm -hmm. So obviously the color was there, right? Because mm -hmm. there was a blue sky and the ocean was blue. Mm -hmm. You got deep enough. But there was no word yeah. for blue until some certain time that they figured it out. Uh, yeah, that is trippy. So, so this kind of speaks to that idea of how things around us, there are things around us in our real experience that we can't put a word to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there, but not there. Yeah, like they're there but inaccessible. Yeah. Or not accessible. That'd be a better word. Yeah. It's um it reminds me of the story about when uh Columbus's ships came to the New World mm -hmm. and the the natives on the beach, they weren't Native Americans yet because right. it wasn't America. They were uh, just free indigenous peoples. That's right. Uh looked out onto the horizon and did not see the ships because yeah, they had never that. seen something like that didn't know what to call right. it so uh it, that was from the movie what the bleep right so i mean how do you even figure that one out i don't know right it's not I mean, like it, the indigenous guy said hey columbus you know when you came in i couldn't even see you, you. were invisible wow dude you had like <laughs> stealth technology going on <laughs> uh, and i don't even know what that is yet <laughs> another way to interpret it would be that they saw it they just didn't know what it was or what to call it or whether it was scary or friendly right. it, it's it's like the people who saw the tidal wave happening uh, the tsunami happening um south asian tsunami yeah. Yeah. where they saw it happening they saw the water receding they didn't know what it meant. Right. So they didn't know to say, oh my gosh, Run we have to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, this is dangerous. Thing, Some it? of them walked right out to follow, you know, the receding waters and see what was on the sand because maybe it was so unusual. Fish. Yeah, or maybe they saw a cool oh, man. seashell. Yeah. I, have had, I have had this dream from my 20s yeah. about tidal waves. Hmm. It hasn't happened in a long time, but. It's hmm. probably, I was probably getting ready to be overwhelmed by something. Yeah, exactly. I uh, think that would be the metaphorical uh, implication. Somebody had posted it. online on one of my Irish sites. Mm -hmm. They showed this little cabin on, um, uh, on the wild Atlantic way. Mm -hmm. And they had this gigantic wave and all these people go, oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. I, I'm like, yeah, I think that's photoshopped you guys. And then it was like, instead of people like going, oh yeah, I guess they're like, oh, there's one in every crowd. Oh, really? They right? chose to believe but, it? But this, this building, okay. So the building, the building is here, right? Okay. All right. So the building's here and then this wave is cresting over it, Uh huh. but the wave is behind the building. Okay. Right. So if the wave was in front of the building, right? So like I look smaller now, uh -huh. right? So now I look bigger. <laughs> so logically, the wave could not be four times taller than mm. this little cottage. Okay. I mean, that would be a 40 foot wave. Yes. And if it were in the distance where it wouldn't have hurt the cottage, it would probably have been an even bigger wave because of perspective and distance. Exactly. It would smaller. have to be like, you know. That's anyway. where I go and research things on the internet because yes. um, there was a time when friends were sending around a picture of uh, an airplane in mid-flight breaking apart and what the people inside were experiencing and these photographs that were found later mm -hmm. and a bunch of people had passed it around uh, friends and strangers alike and i recognized that it was a scene from the television series lost oh and they just took stills and sent it out and said oh my gosh this is amazing 
And I said, well, no, that, that's really good filmmaking, <laughs> television production. Yeah. And then everyone went, oh, okay, yeah. But I mean, I recognized the actors. There's so really, always <laughs> one. There's always one. So uh, don't believe everything. Like that almost you anything. See. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have healthy curiosity. Yeah, why not? Yeah. So taking things back to, um, I just wanted to make this point because I yeah. forgot to make it in the second service. Okay. Because I realized about halfway through my talk that I forgot to bring in the book that I wanted to quote, which was oh. this thing called You. Mm. My favorite book by Ernest Holmes. Mm. And it, it was from uh, uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend uh, Joshua Reeves, the co-minister out at Mile High. We were out there on Wednesday night. Mm. And he had had the passage memorized, which I do not. Okay. But the idea is this. So You want me to look it up as you're saying it? Uh, yes. I'll fact check uh, your quote. Uh, I think it's called... I'll look at small, this. See if you can get small affection. Small Ernest Holmes. See if it comes up. Affection. So the idea... So we we're just talking about this idea. If you had seven, dare to lose your small affection. Dare to lose your small affection. That's it. And you will find it increased and multiplied a million times through greater union. Right. So, um, so this idea that we were talking about earlier, right, was mm -hmm. seven billion mirrors. Mm -hmm. Right. So Ernest Holmes uh, uh, has this like little exercise. Okay. Where he encourages people to to think about a few people mm -hmm. whom you love mm -hmm. that you have a direct experience of and you're very fond of and you love mm -hmm. and then to increase that mm -hmm. you did say that in, um, in the service well i kind of hacked it i think okay but uh <laughs> like i'm going to do now but you can look it up in it's in chapter 12 mm -hmm. of uh this thing called you and it's about halfway through the chapter and uh he talks about um, magnifying that care and concern for those few people now, and now to, to allow that to expand, to uh, include ultimately everyone on the planet. And mm. then he says, dare to lose your small affection. So mm -hmm. in other words, dare to love people from beyond your the finite world that you're familiar with mm -hmm. to uh, to be as great as possible. That reminds me of a quote I heard earlier today. I was watching a YouTube video of Joanna Macy, who is the founder of the work that reconnects, which is a deep ecology mm -hmm. and a spirituality and uh, systems um studies i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she said that we need to encompass the circles of care beyond just our family and um uh to because we can decide what our boundary is of right. who we are and who we identify with so when we stretch that boundary to include animals to include larger portions of our country to include the whole world, then we are becoming one mm -hmm. with all that is. So it's a very similar thing that we have to start with an awareness there is more and then be willing to stretch ourselves right. to connect with it. So this morning I was reading this book, Nonviolent Communication. You know this book? Mm -hmm. I've Marshall. heard of it. I, I don't know if I've Marshall heard of it. Marshall Rosenberg. Okay. Yeah, that sounds familiar. So, I'm, I'm not sure. What Want me to look it up? <laughs> sure, why not? Since I'm quoting it. But uh -huh. he tells a story in there about that his uncle shared with him about his grandmother. Mm. And she tells a story of when Jesus came to visit. Hmm. And he was talking, he was asking about where uh, his uh where the compassion, like his mother had a very compassionate heart. So he's asking his uncle where he thought that came from. He said, well, it's easy from our grand, from your grandmother. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
and he had never heard the story of when Jesus uh, came to visit. Now she was a, an immigrant, okay, of some kind from Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing Eastern Europe. They're mm -hmm. Jewish, okay. Um, and and he was just talking about how he came to develop this nonviolent communication thing. Mm. But uh, the story was that somebody came to the door because even though she was very poor herself, she had a reputation of feeding people mm. in need. Mm -hmm. And so she invited the man in and she asked him his name. And uh, he said, Jesus. And, uh, and of course he was, you know, all long haired and scraggly beard and ragged mm. clothes. And, mm. and she said, uh, Oh, Jesus, who? And he said, Jesus, the Lord. And so when his uncle came in later, who would have been a child at this time, okay. she introduced him as Mr. The Lord <laughs> because her English was not okay. so good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that, that man continued to live with them for seven years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that, that there was compassion. another family who, a tailor who lost his business mm. and the tailor and his two children lived with them. Wow. For three years till he got it back on his feet. And I'm just thinking, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't it's just, it's imagine. amazing. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine really. Well, in today's world it is. And I did look up, you are correct. Nonviolent communication is by Marshall Rosenberg. So. I got to tell you, man, I could, Every I've tried reading this book a couple of times. I'm finding the stories really interesting, mm -hmm. but, and then he does these examples of how to use it. I'm like, Oh my God, who can talk that way? <laughs> right? Well, you might have to tweak it for your own style. Well, I mean, he was talking about being in a conversation with nine other people okay, and saying, you know, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you, but I would really like to spend this time connecting with you. And, and I'm just really, not able to do that because what you're saying right now it, it does not really interest me. Is there something else that we can talk about? I mean, hmm. oh my God. There might be a smoother way to go about that. Well, I'm, you know, I'm hacking it. Right, up. right. But, and I'm thinking, oh my God, he didn't. And then he, and then he was saying, well, that the speaker himself was kind of bored. <laughs> right with what he was saying sometimes i get bored with my own stories that i'm telling so i'm like oh my god i i can't talk this way I, no but right? it, it would be because interesting because you're listening because you're listening to what people are feeling that's, right that's the key right so uh -huh. you're observing what are they feeling and then you're you you're could ask them, a question you're giving them feedback so right so am i right in that you are feeling xyz and i'm like I can't talk like that. <laughs> I think you probably already do, but it's it's phrased so differently that you don't realize really? it. I just yeah. think that a lot of times I'm kind of a jerk. I'm just gonna <laughs> <laughs> um well you're certainly not that person when you're up speaking on Sunday. I mean, you're a regular person, you're like somebody that I don't feel is necessarily up on a pedestal and different than everybody else because you you share now, stories from I should experience. say if I was in conflict let's say with Stephanie okay uh, or you know anyone that I care anyone in the congregation or people mm -hmm. I care about mm -hmm. I would probably after I got over my defensiveness mm. well maybe that's what it is part of it is inside of me I'm like oh, eh. <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> but on the outside, I'm like, okay, how, what would Spock do? <laughs> Spock? That's an interesting example. Yeah, you know, just trying, okay. Yeah. Or as uh, Stratton Smith would say, lower my shield of anxiety. Mm. And ask yourself, why is this bothering me so much? And, you know what about me is reacting to this? I mean, there, there could be an internal. No, but man, when you're like locked up, um, I'd like to, it's, I mean, he's gone now. Yeah. And I remember we actually had him here. He oh. did a, for ions. Okay. He did a presentation hmm. and he did the thing with the giraffe and the puppets and all that. 
which I, uh, was such a I'm distraction. I'm familiar with that. Well, it'd be great with I'm kids. I'm a fan of puppets, though. Well, basically what he, he uses a giraffe with, for the gentle, compassionate. Well, maybe, do you have to be gentle to be compassionate? Mm. Well, it's certainly speaking with compassion and empathy, which is the key part of this right. nonviolent communication thing. And now I've just really diverted us off. <laughs> well, but, no, because we can tie that back to reflection in that what part of nonviolent communication is reflecting, um, or this is what I'm hearing from you. Let's see? look at that, you know? Um, or, but you don't have to say it in that way necessarily. So what I think I'm hearing from you is that you're feeling very confused from what I've just said. <laughs> you weren't is listening that right? to me at all. Um, I think humor is a great way to um, smooth difficult conversations. Things. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it, you also have to be careful not to deflect. Right. And I have done that in the past. Okay. And it, hmm. and I I mean when we were doing that whole talk on sacred sexuality, I did it a few times just because, you know, I'm like, oh boy, let me tiptoe around. It's a little bit of an awkward. Why didn't I even thing. do this? Did topic? you find out um, how many other people at the convention? Oh yeah, you know, all like going. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I let someone else talk to that. I had to get out here to the convention. I took that Sunday off. All right. I mean, I would say probably, I don't know, at least half, if not 75% of the people didn't even speak to it. Mm. I'm thinking, you big pansies. <laughs> yeah, they were a little, a little cowardly sneaking I mean, out on that. I mean that in a compassionate way. Of course. Way. <laughs> well, you know, there's being real and authentic yeah. and there are ways to be um a reflection for somebody else without being condescending without being that, annoying that, the reflection idea is a very powerful i mean when you really realize mm -hmm. that i'm projecting my stuff out there and i used to think that was such bullshit mm. right mm -hmm. <clears throat> and but the more because I had a, a psychologist buddy of mine. Mm -hmm. It was like one of the things that he was always on about because when I was going through the last year or two of my divorce, he was encouraging me. He was encouraged me to try and find ways to communicate without so much anger. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and how what I was saying was really a reflection of my own unhealed stuff. Okay. Uh, that he said, and when you heal the stuff with your father, you will find, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Right? Because he goes, well, you know, you're just not ready to look at that yet. But the truth is, is that you were abused mm. when, when you were a kid. Okay. Through the, you know, it wasn't done on purpose mm -hmm. and it wasn't, it wasn't done intentionally uh, because mm. people, uh, when they know better, they do better. Yeah. Right. But, um, but he was saying, when you get that one worked out, then you'll find this other stuff. Right. But, but he was like, you know, uh, you shouldn't leave your marriage until you can do so without being angry. Hmm. And of course I got to the point like, oh, fuck man, it's gonna to take too long for that. And <laughs> I just bailed. Right. But, but this goes to that reflect of, if what's going on in here mm -hmm. is being reflected out there. Yes, and, it's the and, lens that colors everything yeah, that we and so see I have to and say, how we respond. Yeah, so all these years later, you know, mm -hmm. almost, gosh, 20 years later, mm -hmm. You know, I feel bad about the way I conducted myself and that, you know, and I've, I'm curious as to what effect that had on things, hmm. but there's nothing I can do about that now. Right. Except to, to the best of my ability, not subject my wife, Stephanie, mm -hmm. to my unhealed stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. which of which there still is some i don't know where that defensive stuff comes from i don't know if that's like uh 
the masculine uh, be. personality or if women are just, you know, uh, more, uh, how you say, uh, acculturated to stuffing, like they haven't had permission to be defensive maybe. Okay. And so I don't know. I think it's but, certain personality types and whatever, uh, whatever they found themselves responding to as children and then uh, sort of internalized that response and carried that through responding to everything. Now you grew up in unity. Yes, I did. So in unity, say in your youth program, mm -hmm. you went through a youth program. Yep. So I would presume that they would have had a very uh, affirming uh, of the child personality would be very affirming. And not uh, damning, or I don't, I don't know what the right word is, but right. So it wasn't a, a traditional system that I've heard or read about mm -hmm. um, from other religious traditions. Um, it was, it was new thought applied to children. So one thing I remember is. Um, like one of my earliest memories of going to church was learning about forgiveness and forgiving uh, those who seem to be doing us wrong mm -hmm. and uh, to approach it differently. To, so I remember sitting on the swing set in my backyard mm -hmm. and being really angry at one of my neighborhood friends and thinking, okay, I need to forgive this person so mm -hmm. that I can move on. So, you know, I ended up going back and playing with my friends later and it, it calmed me down and I don't remember what the incident was. I just remember that, that moment for some reason. Yeah. Um, but I know in my, in, as a teenager in the Youth of Unity, we did learn about, it was called Heart Talks. Mm -hmm. And so we'd sit in a circle and what, whoever had anything to share on mm -hmm. whatever topic it was. And we did this at the, at the international gatherings as well mm. um whoever was holding the heart or the you know whatever it was the symbolic thing that yeah. said that the talking stick right um could speak whatever was on their heart or mind and be in a supportive environment to be heard and not fixed and not um you know, told what to do or think, but just really heard and supported and loved. And I think that was an amazing tool to have because I didn't realize it until much later that a lot of people don't have that, that gift of space and acceptance and being able to say exactly what you're thinking and feeling and having it be accepted. And then there were, you know, it wasn't just left out there. We weren't just left with you know, open wounds or something. Cause mm -hmm. some of the stuff that, that other kids shared was pretty heavy stuff. They yeah. might've been in abusive homes or, you know, had issues of like. Yeah, well, I, I heard things myself as a youth advisor. Mm. Yeah, at camp. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, the tools for kids in Unity and uh, Centers for Spiritual Living and New Thought movements are there. And I'm sure many other religious paths, if you're part of a Buddhist center, mm -hmm. they have tools, and but that's not gonna fix the human condition that mm -hmm. you keep bringing up, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So we, are in this process of evolution of taking the tools and using them. And yet there will still be challenges. It's, it doesn't mean that life goes smoothly and that nothing bad ever right. happens. Life is life. And so that also gets stressed with yeah, the kids. Yeah. Which is important. Yeah, so, I mean, what a powerful way, mm -hmm. you know, to grow up. And, yeah. Um, anyway. But uh, to this idea then that uh, that we are uh, projecting our yes. unhealed stuff out there, mm -hmm. uh, we're also projecting our healed stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the good news. It so is good I know news. that 
I know that for, you know, I, I found new thought in my mid forties and um, boy, I just, uh, I wouldn't have said so um, at the time, but I really, my, my, a lot of my insecurities and a lot of my unhealed stuff really got sorted out mm. very quickly. I mean, within, you know, three or four years, which at the time just seemed like, oh God, you know, when is it ever going to get any better, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, looking at it now, uh, you know, 15 years later, uh, it just, it, it was so transformational. It's why mm -hmm. I, it's why I so love and appreciate the teaching mm -hmm. because um, at its root, really what it is is spiritual psychology. Yeah. So, and the thing that I like about it is, you know, psychologically, you know, we can, oh, you got to set those goals and you got to get your mind right and you focus and you know, like the Stephen Covey, you know, the seven effective things right. and sharpen the saw. So and, those are tools. Uh, th those are all tools. And, and so we have that spiritual or uh, we have the psychological component. Right. But then we have this uh, spiritual practice that we can mm. uh, bring to it. Yeah. And that's like, you know, that's like the cosmic shoulder to the cart that kind of gets us out of the ditch and, you know, and then gets us on our way again. You yeah. Know? Well, and that's, I think, why 12-step programs are so successful and have helped so many people is for some people that is their first introduction to spirituality. And it is an essential component of the 12 steps. You can't, you can't do a 12 step program without those important steps. Mm -hmm. And so it's a uh, holistic healing. It's mind, body, spirit. Yeah. And um, n it, it takes finding a place where you can understand and connect to and just really resonate with the message. So some people might, feel more comfortable at a Buddha center or, you know, some other place. Mm -hmm. But I feel like um, people from all different backgrounds can be comfortable in new thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one thing that, uh, the one thing that I think new thought does offer, mm -hmm. well, there's many things, but uh, I think it's a nice blending of uh, Eastern thought with its uh, uh, focus on meditation and uh, right thinking, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so it's like cultural, culturally holistic with the Eastern and Western. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because most of us are still coming from it, from, we're still coming to spirituality from a Judeo-Christian right. Um what would you call it? Morality, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. It's kind um, of our cultural mindset. framework. Right. So, you know, most people know the Ten Commandments roughly mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you can find equivalents in the precepts of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, and if I knew more about Hinduism, I would probably know that there is a code in that as well, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. Yeah. So, uh, as within, so without, <laughs> that's what we're questions. reflecting. Yeah. But you know, <coughs> we're, we're living in a multifaceted life and, uh, it, it takes all the facets sort of being paid attention to. So our shadow side, as well as, I mean, that's where psychology is very helpful that, we don't want to do a spiritual bypass and just put a shiny, happy veneer over everything. We right. want to heal the deeper stuff. We right. want to face the wounds and the shadows and all of that right. and uh, do it with a community. I, I read an article earlier about, um, it, it was a movie review, but it ended up being about how our society has become more focused on individual happiness. Families have broken up. And now that family unit of having the grandparents and the little kids and 
family gatherings where people had support that they were born into mm. isn't available to most people. Yeah. And that's where spiritual centers like this can offer that intergenerational they can, support yeah. and sharing. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, that has always been the vision yeah. that I have had for this place mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I did, I grew up without the benefit of grandparents. Mm. Uh, maybe you can relate to this because half of them were, uh, they were just across, way across the country or on the other, you know, in England or in Ireland. Yeah. So both it wasn't, uh, it wasn't. Both of one set were yeah, not uh, present. Right. So on my dad's side, so mm -hmm. my mom, my my grandmother and my aunt and my uncle, they were all out in California, and we were in Ohio. Oh, okay. At Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Mm. And so we did have a couple of summers where we did the cross country thing in the station wagon. Like, wow. Yeah, it's like the National Lampoon. <laughs> did you sit in the way way back? In the, the way way back, uh -huh, yeah, the sure station did. wagon. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in fact, we even got in a car accident going one year, and it oh. ruined our, we just got this tent camper, Aww. and I think we might have slept in it like maybe three or four times. Hmm. Some guy fell asleep at the wheel hmm. and rammed into us, and, uh, and our Your ramblers, vacation took a turn. Yeah, in Missouri. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Interesting. I don't know uh, where I was heading before I got into that little tale. Um, but um, family journeys, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, not having the benefit of uh, grandparents around. Ah, uh, yeah. And you know, I think. So here we have this spiritual community here, mm -hmm. and you know, if our first underutilized resource are our practitioners. Mm -hmm. The second would be, and I don't know exactly how to do this, but to create opportunities where our older people, and I'm talking about 70 plus, mm -hmm. uh, can get to know our younger, uh, you know, kids. Yeah. We're starting to get a few again. Mm -hmm. So, it, cause you know, it just, it falls on the parents to get them here really. Yeah. And then we could have this really great generational mixing, which I noticed, by the way, when we had our a young adult service here. Mm. And what would happen is the young adults, because uh, there was a six o'clock service and they started coming in the morning. Okay. And then they started mixing with some of the older people hmm. and uh, and they got more involved in our community because of it. Wow. And um Anyway, it was uh, well. Maybe the power of eight will will the be the power of eight is a one possibility. Of the, yeah. One of the ways, but yeah. I think offering just a whole range of things that people can be interested in and involved in, and the more everybody gets to know each other, it just mm -hmm. you know it just widens yeah, the network. Yeah, and, and of course, I there's a lot of things that I don't do. Uh, just because I do want to keep the focus on one thing, right? I think it's too easy to chase the next shiny object. Mm -hmm. So I do try to keep it focused on religious science. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know, uh, so no crystals, no right. pendulums. Right. A no, core teaching. Yeah. And then you can, identity. you know, you want to work all these other things, tarot and, uh, you know, uh, Enneagram and you know mm -hmm. astrology you know all this other stuff you want to work that in that's fine mm. but our focus here uh, because there's enough to do mm -hmm. I mean if change your thinking change your life sounds oh <laughs> piece of cake right <laughs> but you know it's really it takes a lot of focus to change our thinking and we mm. to your point it's easier in, in spiritual community because in here, at least for an hour, and if we're taking classes for mm -hmm. two or three hours, 
we're immersed in a thought atmosphere. Right. That um, like-minded people. Well, and uh, because part of that is taking taking responsibility for our own thought, because mm-hmm. what we're thinking is being reflected out there. There we are with reflection again. Right. Uh, volunteering is another way to connect with people and really just get mm-hmm. to know, just working on a project together, whatever it is, right. um, helps people connect and share. And then you have time to chit chat and get to know each other. So, By the way, yes. speaking of projects, yes. have you heard from the Friends of the LA River? It's March. Oh, no. They're kind of flaky. They don't really reach out. I guess they're, uh, they just do their thing and hope everybody knows to reach out to them. I, I will look into that because it's time. It is about time we go clean up some LA River. I just, you know, I always like that project mm-hmm. because it gets us outside. Yeah. And um, gets a little exercise. Mm-hmm. Some years we've had a lot of kids with us. Oh, that'd be cool. Uh, I know, remember one year Hilda had. Uh, now, uh, she had her two daughters who were already Girl Scouts. Mm. But you know, it, it's it's interesting watching kids who are all who already know how to be of service. Okay, yeah, right. Because uh, Amber and Eileen just went right to it. And, you mm. know, they were like picking up trash and everything else, and these other kids are like. Mm. <laughs> so well, that's that was fun. We had at one time we had a. Gosh, we must have had half dozen girls hmm. who were Girl Scouts. Oh, nice. Great, great energy. Maybe we should reach out to the local Girl Scouts and see if they want to join us. Yeah. Yeah. I give that task to you. <laughs> oh, all right. I'll add it to my little list. Well, I think we've... Uh, We've talked all the way around many, many things. (laughs) And hopefully um, you are watching still and you enjoyed the strange and interesting journey of a conversation. Or you set your timer and you're now deeply asleep. (laughs) I don't know if this would be a good thing to sleep to. (laughs) So thanks for joining us on Thoughts on Talks. And uh, let us know, did you stay awake? Did you sleep? Did you have a thought? Yeah. Do you have any questions? Do you want me to look something up for you? Because I'll do it and I'll let you know. Would you like to join us on the chat sometime? Ooh, that's We can figure that one out too. <laughs> yes, we can. All right. All right. So thanks and to See you. Bye next month. Now. Oh my gosh. Next month is like in the a few sacred days. sacred feminine. Ah, uh, what is he going to have to say about that? Oh boy! Oh, wait, you got to show him the. Uh, you got to show him the. The reflection. The reflection thing. Okay. Is that easily done? Uh, that reflection on your glasses? No, the one that you did with the screen. Thing. Uh, oh, that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I. Let's see. So it was Speaking not so much alternate realities. Yeah, it was choose a virtual background. And let's see if it shows up on the screen. That Ooh, is look, I look like Roger Stone right now. Oh, that's not a good thing to look Don't like. Don't send me to jail. You look like somebody from the Matrix, maybe. Okay, so that's us in space. Morpheus. <laughs> that's us in the grass. <laughs> this is us out in San Fran. Are you going <laughs> to San Francisco? or out to space. <laughs> All right. I don't, I hope people can see it. Maybe they can't. <laughs> we'll just close out. Well, on that's this. cool. <laughs> Commencing countdown engines on. Mm-hmm. Ignition and may God's love be with you. <laughs> okay, we're going to Bye. Bye. It was the best part.